And I just wanted to welcome everybody to our online gardening workshop today. Nice intimate group, so hopefully we're going to have a, a chance to have a chat at the end. Uh, just a reminder that these workshops um, were created in response to COVID-19 lockdown this spring and there are collaboration between a number of community growers in our area, uh, which includes Strathkinis Community Garden, Tayport Community Garden, Nine Wills Community Garden, Yellow Wellies Garden and St Andrews Transition Edible Campus. So lots of people involved. Uh, my name is Kashka Hempel and I'm a digital storytelling and carbon conversation coordinator for plants or people um, uh, learning about nature and Tayport. We are part of Tayport Community Trust and we run a Tayport Community Garden and lots of associated projects. And at the moment we're funded through Cl uh, Climate Challenge Fund, which is Scottish government funding. And I'm here to help out with technicalities today and um, mo most importantly introduce our gardening expert presenter, was Peter Christopher, uh, our community gardener here at Tayport. And he's being helped today by his wife, Kirsty, who's also his gardening assistant. So she'll chip in with gardening advice, I think, but mainly is going to be doing the videoing of the whole thing. So um, lots of multitasking going on. Um, and we will also have help from Helena uh, Simmons, who is the Nine Walls Community Garden person, and she's going to help with Q&A at the end of the session. So um, without much further ado, I think I'm going to hand over to Peter to take us around the community garden and talk about pests and diseases. Okay. Right, over to you, Peter. Well, hi there and welcome to the Tayport Community Garden. Uh, we're going to be talking about pests and diseases, as you know, but it's a huge subject and um, it's going to be quite tricky to get much. But that's why if I get any questions at the end, that will be the thing that really helps. Um, there's even a huge RHS book about pests and diseases. So it, as you can imagine, this, this subject is massive. But books are good because they're instant reference when you're out in the garden unless you've you know online it's good but you can look up much more quicker i find with a book now then most people who've been starting gardening this particular year because of the lockdown uh, will probably be growing potatoes whether it's in the open ground or in containers and as you can see from the index page here the list of diseases and pests and potatoes is particularly long uh, it starts up here and goes all the way down. So we're going to be able to just touch on a few of them. So now the one thing that we've been having a real problem with is a slug called a keel slug. Now it makes tiny little holes in the potato, goes inside, makes itself a wonderful potato cave in which it lives and is free from any predators and the consequence of that is that after storage the potato starts to rot. So these are still edible if you cut out the slug but if you're squeamish it might put you off altogether. So the solution. There is no chemical solution that even if you wanted to. So what the gardeners of old used to do was get zinc perforated zinc and put bits of potato and carrot and what have you inside it and bury it in the soil. So this works just as well. It's one of these carrot or onion bags that you can get. So you fill it full of peelings from the kitchen or bits of your potato that got infected and um, stick it in the soil. Now unfortunately because we were not being able to go at full tilt this year there was a few things that didn't get done. This was one of them. Um, but I did it at home and when I pulled it out of the ground, yes indeed there were keel slugs inside that. It also controls millipedes and wireworms. Uh, wireworms are the larvae of a beetle called the click beetle and they're orange and about an inch long and they will find their way into your potatoes too. Now <clears throat> the worst disease of potato that you can get is potato blight. And that's when the entire plant, this is the one that caused the Irish famine, the potato famine. Now, we have only just spotted one plant with this kind of discoloration and dieback. So 
if you see these signs on your potatoes, get a pair of shears and immediately cut the holms back, the holms of the green bits on top. And if you do that, you can prevent the leaf blight from getting into the tubers and causing tuber blight. And if you do particularly uh, see it first, dig them up and try and eat them quickly because they will not store well. What else do we have? Now, this is a disease that is no one's fault because it comes in with your seed potato. This is called blackleg and it's caused by a bacterium. And sometimes if you've planted your potato tuber and it's had some of that because it's been missed out in the seed potato selection process, then again, cut it back, lift the potatoes and use them because it will not store. Thankfully, I had to hunt through the entire potato patch to find one, so we're not doing too badly at all. Some people ask me about holes in their potato leaves and um, bits and pieces. Now, discoloration and a wee bit of um, contortion. This isn't a problem really. It's caused because there's a sap sucking bug called the capsid bug. It has a meal and the area that it's put its um, proboscis into to suck the sap out does not differentiate. In other words, it doesn't grow. And so you tend to find that these holes get bigger as the leaf gets bigger. You'd have to have a really bad infestation for it to affect your crop. Righty ho. Uh, onwards now, I'm going to just walk ahead and then Kirsty will come and uh, film me when I'm facing the camera. Maybe you could pan round the garden. It's a good view, place to have a view of the garden. So beside the potato plot, we had our willow tunnel over here. And as you pan round, we have this area under the trees, which is our outdoor classroom. And before this all happened, the local primary school used to come and do various activities. Now, back to the pests. These are kohlrabi, which got attacked by pigeons because our covering, which was a horticultural fleece like this, blew off. And the lesson we learned, we've obviously left this to be able to show you the damage of what it looks like. And the only problem with this stuff is it does blow off very easily. So we opt for This material here, which is called Enviro Mesh, very, very fine holes. Um, this got covered up after I'd noticed that some of the bugs were making holes in our Swedes, but they'll they'll mature nicely. The good thing about this stuff is it's reusable. Sometimes the fleece gets so dirty with mud splashes and rain that it's difficult to reuse and it tears very easily. Another fantastic use for this is in carrots. Now, <clears throat> the biggest pest of carrots is the carrot root fly. And that's when you harvest your carrots and find that there's maggots been tunneling away inside them. It's very difficult to use your crop after that. So this stuff is fine enough to stop the fly getting through this mesh. Plus, being at a height, the carrot root fly tends to fly along the ground really low, following the scent of the cabbage, sorry, the carrot family that it feeds on. So in this way, it has to come up and go over. Um, so planting carrots in a raised bed is a way of controlling the carrots. Now, here's a fine bed of leeks. Leeks are fairly free of any problems, but there is one that you can look out for. leek rust. Now rust is a kind of fungus and if it gets too rampant on a young plant it could in fact um, decrease its vigour to get bigger. Um, it comes in the wind so there's not an awful lot you can do about it. 
there is a possible solution that I haven't tried, but I may do in future years when the plants are younger. I'll show you about that later. Um, you could remove the leaves to maybe stop the rust from spreading to the healthy living plants. Um, you don't eat that bit anyway. You don't eat that bit anyway, you're quite right. And onions. Um, we've harvested most of our onions. And the problem you can get with onions, there's a few, but the, the main one is a disease called white nose. And this is when your plant completely just collapses and is not looking good at all. And it's a fungus that grows on the root plate underneath the onion and kills all the roots off. And so essentially it's um, going to desiccate. Rotation is the only thing you can do about that. Um, you've got to be able to have another part of the garden that you can plant your onions in future. And some people say that you can't plant the onions in the same plot for many, many years after that. So that's when container gardening might come in handy. So you can use fresh compost rather than garden soil. This is a matter of interest. We've had a couple of volunteers here who, after they have harvested the onions, have sown a green manure. Now, a green manure is a plant that will germinate, lock up the nutrients over the winter, and then we can dig them back in in the spring. And this one is called Hungarian grazing rye. You can get other mixes as well that have clover, which is very good for fixing nitrogen. Onwards. Nice herb garden that's been cared for by one of our volunteers. Looking great. Herbs tend to be fairly trouble free. Broad beans, on the other hand, they do have a series of not too bad, but uh, you can get black aphid, which we spotted on here the other day. And the way that you can control that is by nipping out the growing top. And uh, obviously that's getting rid of the colony so it doesn't spread to other plants. We also saw some, again, a fungus called rust. Oh, it's quite bad on this one. This tends to happen when the plant is quite old and after it's set its crop of beans. So it's kind of like a, a thing of old age. And so you'll still be able to get a crop, but same as potatoes, never use this plant material on your compost heap. Bag it and bin it. Peas, they're fairly uh, pest free, but we do, there is a pest that's called, um, well, pigeons for one, of course, and uh, mice, if you've got the plants growing near where mice live. And um, the way you can do something about that is to plant your peas in pots first and wait until they're a decent size then plant them out um, but we have discovered a really fairly major problem that people are experiencing in the country I'm just going to show you that this contortion and discoloration of the leaf is caused because when we make our compost we've been given very kindly a trailer load of farmyard manure from the local farm. But we suspect that the farmer has been using a herbicide called aminopyrlid, which is persistent in the straw of the plant. It's a, a herbicide to kill all the broadleaf weeds and leave the grass type weed, uh, crops like barley, oats and what have you are still alive. And it can pass through the, uh, the stomach of a ruminant and be present in the dung. So I think in future we'll maybe try and source our dung from our farmyard manure from an area that hasn't been using this chemical. And next. This is our outdoor sweet corn. And uh, the pest that you can sometimes get on this are earwigs, which bite and chew off the female tassels, which, these are the male flowers that shed the pollen on the top and the female tassels down below. 
If you begin to see that, you can make ear rig traps. Uh, to do this, get an old cup, we're using our reusable veg packs, and put some straw in it. And if the ear rigs are there, they'll love to, over, to you know, hide in it during the day. Lucky, we're not getting any, but it does give you an idea of whether or not they're present. Uh, this is our cabbage patch. And we've discovered over the last few years that it's absolutely essential to cover them up in order to one their young plants and keep the pigeons off. And at this time of year, the cabbage white butterflies are very prevalent. And even with this amount of protection, they can still find their way in and lay their eggs. And then of course you get loads of cabbage white butterflies. The other thing that we get in here with slugs and snails is a potential problem. And again, we'll talk about a solution for that when we go into the polytunnel. One last thing on the outdoor crops. We're really proud of this. This is our apricot. That's, uh, it's been in now two years and we're really pleased to see. But as with plums, you tend to get at this time wasps. And wasps will bite open and then start chewing the, the inside of the, your plums or in this case apricots. A good organic solution is to get some jam, marmalade, jam, whatever, put it in a jam jar and pour a bit of hot water in and then if you hang that from the tree the wasps tend to get attracted to this solution. It's easier to access. If you put a bit of alcohol in it with you know, beer, then they tend to get a bit intoxicated and they fall in and drown. So they die happy. Right, let's go to the polytunnel and see some of the tender crops that we have. Hi, Ali. <laughs> Ali's our volunteer coordinator Hello. and uh, this is our indoor growing area. We have the, what's the North Americans used to call these three sisters growing system. This is made up of the squash or pumpkin family, in this case courgettes, beans, which used to be grown up the corn. And the three of them together were a good grow area, a way to use a small space, and it was called the Three Sisters. Now, I found that the, probably the biggest pest of these particular kinds of plants is red spider mite. And red spider mite is when, we're lucky we've none to show you, it's more likely to be in greenhouses or conservatories. The leaves go completely mottled and speckled and then you turn over there's a very fine filament of like spider webs on them. They're very small, you could fit one on a pinhead but they breed like crazy and you get thousands. The whole plant can collapse. There is a solution. I'll show you what we would use as a preventative but if they get a bad infestation, there's a biological control organisms. And you can get, funnily enough, a red spider mite that eats the red spider mite. And I'm reminded of the old expression that used to be, big bugs have smaller bugs upon their backs to bite them, smaller bugs have tiny bugs, and so ad infinitum, the whole food cycle in nature. So, uh, same can happen, but not to such a great extent with the courgettes. And 
we have a pest in the moment with our dwarf French beans. We might as well pull that out because we've had a real problem. No, you can't see any just now. With slaters, which some people call wood, wood lice. And uh, never had such a problem with them before, but I suspect it's because even though we have this drip irrigation system, some areas are not getting as much water as they would like. And the wood lice love that particular combination of dryness and sort of moistness underneath the soil. And they normally only eat um, organic matter, but they will have a go at beans and what have you. And again, we'll have a solution to show you. Tomatoes, pests and diseases. Everyone, you know, after tomatoes, uh, after potatoes, I think tomatoes is probably the most common crop that people have if they have a windowsill greenhouse conservatory. And red spider mite can affect these as well. Um, uh, but what they tend to be able to have first, again, I'm glad I haven't got any to show you, is white fly. A white fly are these tiny little like miniature moths, very white. And um, they will breed like crazy and do reduce the vigor of the plant. Another thing that you can get on tomatoes is called blossom end rot. We don't have any, but this end is called the blossom end and it will turn black. Now this is a question of deficiency. And um, people think that it's caused by irregular watering, but also a calcium deficiency. So what we've done in this situation is to add a little bit of seaweed meal, which has got more micronutrients, a bit like you know, like calcium in it. And we have this watering system, which comes kicks in from a solar powered pump that delivers our harvested rainwater into the seat hoses. Now, um, right. Mm -hmm. Light. Light. Oh yeah, of course. I don't think we've got any. We haven't got any, but potato, potato blight can also affect tomatoes. Um, not an awful lot you can do about it because there's no chemicals available to amateur gardeners, even it's professional gardeners. Blight resistant varieties. Mm -hmm. I should have mentioned, you're quite right Kirsty, blight resistant varieties on potatoes. You can look them up and uh, you can also, yeah, just, just read the, uh, the, the information about the varieties uh, to see whether or not they have some bright light resistance. Um, here's some of the um, potions and lotions. This one is a solution of soft soap. Now you can get these from organic suppliers. Soft soap is really just a soap that's based on potassium as opposed to sodium salts. It's fatty acids too. So we dissolve it in hot water and add it to our sprayer. But we also drop a few garlic cloves in as well because garlic is antifungal or it should be except for this particular pest. We were talking earlier about white nose and this is one or two garlic cloves that got it in the garden. And as you can see, the base plate's almost rotting away completely. This can also be a very good solution to the problem with gooseberry American mildew. This is when your gooseberry starts to get covered in mold, basically. We sprayed ours uh, probably in sometime in June when they were very small and this year we've been very lucky. I don't know if it's the conditions, we haven't done a control to see that it hasn't spread to them. Other solutions for the trouble with the beans being eaten by the slaters, wood lice. The old fashioned books used to say that you would mix oatmeal with a substance called borax which is almost like an old fashioned detergent and they would eat it and the borax would kill them. Well, we've done something similar. We've just used a bit of um, crushed up popcorn and in that we've added some deris dust. The deris is a plant-based pesticide 
um, that if it's at, at, you know used as specifically at the, like this shouldn't cause harm to other organisms. The next one is for slugs and snails, and that's to use a nice drop of beer. Now, I'm using our own home brew from home because there's a thought that the yeast in it is more likely to be, because it's unpasteurized, is more likely to attract the slugs and snails. And this is a very handy device to use because if you were to pour the beer into a tray like that, say, for example, and leave it, then if it was being used outside in your cabbage patch, it would rain and it would be diluted. Or in here, our watering situation. I missed you. <laughs> Hello, Daniel. I'll go on your tractor. Come back in 10 minutes. I'll speak to you then. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, this is a handy device because <laughs> it stops the beer from being diluted, but it still allows the access for the yeah. offending organisms. Now, for the white fly, you can use these white fly traps. Now, these are strips of sticky surface plastic which come with a very handy mounting system so you can hang them up. Um, there are people who are not very keen about these because they think it can also trap beneficial insects like your hard pollinators like um, hoverflies etc. So I think I've covered everything that I was hoping to. So in the meantime, we're going to prop the, mic, uh, the camera up and sit together and start to field your questions. Okay, Kashka? Sounds good. Um, I'm not sure if uh, we can reduce interference from the visitors. Uh, it's Daniel. Yes, well, can Ali... Daniel is one of the, we, we, the garden uh, is a resource for lots of different groups, our Alzheimer's groups, the primary school that I mentioned, and people with autism. Uh, Just shut the door. I don't think the polythene <laughs> cuts out the noise, does it? Uh, and Daniel has obviously been uh, away from the garden since lockdown. Uh, it looks like his mum and dad are happy for him to come in again. So that would be great to get him back into the garden because he was an invaluable volunteer and still is. Your broadband suddenly dropped really low. I don't know what happened. Oh. Oh, it's back. Back? Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, Helena, would you like to yes. take over with... Uh, I would questions? love to, especially because the first two questions that were written down were from me. <laughs> so I'm going to ask myself to read them out. Um, you remember the peelings that you put in, the, in a container? Yeah, and um, mm -hmm. to to get the keel worm, the keel slug. slug. Yeah. And um, how long do you leave them in the ground before you dig out your peelings again? Uh, I I left them for about three or four days. Okay, not very then, long. Not very long, no. Um, this is when you first plant your seed potatoes. So, as I say, didn't get round to it this year because I had to stay away from the garden during that particular period. Um. I would, yeah, no, no longer than a week. Okay. Because, and then you refresh what you're putting in your bag, pop it back in again. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And what do you do with the, the peelings? Are they okay to go in the compost or are you, do you need to deal with what you found? To be fair, they're not in any huge quantity to be a problem. So yeah, you can go in the compost. Okay. The, the other question that I had for you was, does, again, about potatoes, was does black leg spread from one plant to the other? Uh, yes, it can do. Um, but that's why if you come across blight or black bag, you, you, cut, you should cut down the foliage ASAP and get them dug up. Okay. Because at this stage in the game, it's only the very late main crop that are going to uh, continue to grow. Okay. Okay, the next one, Georgiana, you may, made, it was not so much a question as a, a comment, I think. Um, about the leek leaves. Would you like to share what you do with leek leaves? 
Well, I use them like like I use the leeks. And if I make soup, I, I never just use the white part. I use um, both. Um, I never... the, it was on the very outer thick leaves. Well, not the thick ones, obviously. I yeah. just use the green, not healthy leaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's good. I was just, just wondering if, if anyone else wanted to, to comment to that. Um, okay, again, I'm asking all the questions here. So I think there's more questions from other people further down. Um, just when you've, tip, when you've taken out the tip of the broad bean mm -hmm. with the aphids on it, what do you do with the actual tip? Is composting far enough away to get it out of the garden or? Uh, it depends on how squeamish you are. The thumb, and, the, thumb, yeah, the thumb and forefinger give them in very handy. Excellent. Um, okay, and again, Georgiana, you wanted to ask a question about your bay leaf tree. Yes, my, um, yeah, my bay leaf is suffering. It has a lot of blue, they are not white flies, they are blue flies. And the leaves are uh, curling. And uh, yeah, it, I don't know what's going on, but it's a big problem i think but i don't know what to do with it <laughs> that's the kind of thing that i'd probably need to see because okay. it could be a variety of different things i can take but, a photo and send it to you yeah that's fine i suspect that it's always it's just on the youngest leaves is it no necessarily yeah well it, it is but not necessarily i think there is spreading and also uh it gets uh, a bit um I don't know, sticky as well as uh, very powdery and blue. Right, that sounds like a woolly aphis. And the woolly aphis is a cunning thing because what it does is this bluishness is actually a wax. Okay. And it's really difficult to be able to spray even a bio-friendly bio, um, biocide on it, herb um, sorry, pesticide because it sheds water like a duck's back. Okay. And so that's where the soft soap comes in handy because the fatty acids dissolve the waxy coating so that the solution can get at the body of the bug itself. Okay. Um, which works by lowering the surface tension of the water. And so the water actually goes up the breathing tubes called spiracles of insects and pretty well drowns them. So at the first sign of the young leaves coming out, I would use the spray as just a defense. Um, but for this particular coming season, I'd try uh, some soft soap spray on them. Okay. Uh, and uh, can you share with us where do you, you said you buy it from an organic shop? Where, where do you buy it? It's probably online with the organic uh, Chase. Chase Organics. Okay. Or there's, there's quite a few. If you just, yeah, you'd find it easy enough by going online. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay, Georgiana also asked, where did you get your seaweed meal from? Or how, or how do you make it? No, the seaweed meal comes already powdered. And again, that's from uh, Organics uh, Online Shopping. Okay. Some of the garden centres tend not to have that kind of thing. Uh, so sometimes you've got to shop around online for them. That was definitely the case with the soft soap. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Rebecca, you have a question about good pests. <laughs> Would you like to unmute and ask? Uh, sure, yes, yeah, so I've been reading a lot about um, good pests helping to counter the bad pests and letting kind of nature work together. Um, is that not really a thing that you, you can do in your garden or where you attract certain bugs to eat the other bugs and that kind of stuff? Absolutely, yes. Um, they're obviously not pests if they're good. <laughs> beneficial. There were air quotes around it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> beneficial insects. Yes. Uh, now, I did have a photograph from last year where we found a parasitic wasp which had laid eggs on caterpillars. 
in the cabbage patch and this caused the caterpillars to when they climbed out to try and pupate uh, the young wasps larvae were growing away inside it uh, we noticed that so obviously we leave them well alone so that their particular life cycle continues uh, we also have wild flower areas that uh, are very biodiverse and we're more likely to get the links of ladybirds, um, lacewings, uh, other, other beneficial insects coming in and hunting around for the pests that they might be in the garden. We also so last year, I just remembered that, sorry, it's just me butting in. Last year when we had that horrible infestation of uh, red mites and things in the polytunnel, did we use some kind of natural control? That, that's bugs yep. eating bugs, isn't it? That's right. I alluded to it earlier on. We were talking about the uh, runner, the French beans, being a, quite a sufferer of that. And um, that is it. Uh, Phytocelius. Yeah. So if you go on to red spider mite biocontrol, there are quite a lot of companies. Like the big one is called Coppert with a K, K O P P E R T, and they'll be able to supply online with. This is mainly greenhouse bugs, uh, predators for the bugs in the greenhouses. Um, you can get ones for outdoor. Obviously, I'm thinking perhaps of the, the apple codling moth, which is a moth that uh, burrows into apples. And you buy a pheromone, which is a sexual attraction chemical exuded by the female. And uh, these will attract the males, which then climb into the traps and can't get out again. Um, other biocontrols for outdoor crops could be nematodes. And nematodes are microscopic worm. Well, they're not really worms. They're related to uh, leeches, as it was. And they'll be able to hatch out if the soil remains at a particular temperature. Now, that's the... That's the only thing that you have to be able to be able, uh, monitor and uh, control. I think 16 degrees Celsius is the minimum at which they'll work. They're, so it's called nemesis, which is rather apt. So it's a nematode that causes a nemesis, usually in things like uh, slugs, but they can also use it for caterpillars. Vine weevils. Vine weevils as well, yeah. Um, there's a another. I'm just trying to think of another one. Now. Oh yes, for cabbages you can buy something called. I don't know if it's. I don't know the brand name, but it's a bacillus, another bacterium, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, which comes in a powdered form, and you would make that up to a spray. Maybe add a bit of soft soap as well, just so that it clings on to the cabbage leaves. And uh, so if the caterpillar starts to munch out on the leaves, this bacillus gets inside the digestive tract and kills them. So yeah, biological warfare is going on all the time out there. Um, I think people- You'd, you'd need to have it, to be doing it on a bigger scale, really. I think so, because yeah, it's expensive. Anything else? Uh, I think Rebecca, you've got a secondary question about um, cuttings in the compost. Yeah, you talked a bit about um, what not to compost or you put bad things in the compost and you have a problem for a few years. I'm not sure if I heard that right, but I was just curious what happens. Does compost and pest ridden cuttings usually lead to bad pest ridden compost? You know, how, how likely is it that the pest will kind of work its way out during the composting process? Right. Well, I think the most important one is blight and the uh, black leg on the potato that I showed you. Um, most of the other, it's diseases really, rather than pests. Mm. You try to avoid from putting anywhere near your compost heap, because quite a lot of these diseases, they can go dormant by you, the way of uh, making spores, um, which would then be reactivated. Uh, in the compost, it's quite a good idea to try and make the compost heap really quite hot in the process because this would kill over 
wintering seeds and some of the pests that might have found their way into your compost heap. And you'll find out how to compost on another one of our webinars, which you'll find on the taporkgarden.org webpage. Look, thanks. Okay, the next question was from Laura. Um, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hi. Um, it was if you're growing potatoes in these specific sort of uh, grow bags you get for potatoes, are you still as likely to get pests? And if so, should you use the um, peeling option that you that you mentioned? Do you? You could, in fact, yes, get blight because blight is windborne, and um, it depends on the conditions of that particular summer. If we have um, wet, warm summers like we tend to be having this year, then blight will become more prevalent, and being carried in the air, it can land on the leaves and gets woken up by the moist condition, and that's when the infestation starts. If if you're growing in container, chances are you're not going to really have enough in the way of a crop, you know, to justify putting the peelings on your compost heap. So I'd avoid doing that. Oh, and is yes? the keel? I was just thinking, does the keel um, slug? If you're using fresh compost, you wouldn't have to worry about the keel slug. It would only be if you were using soil from your garden and the um, potatoes that you'd need to worry about putting your little bag of peelings in. Yeah, indeed, you've got it. Yeah. Do you feel like your question about adding potato leaves and stems into the compost has been answered? Yeah. And if not, would you like to clarify? Uh, I think, you know, um, just to, uh, wanted to ask whether everyone, you know, added potato leaves and stems in compost generally, like a, yeah, I've seen some people, they, they don't do it at all, they, you know, just in case, you know, there are any, you know, diseases uh, inside. I think some answer, but do you, so do you not put any potato leaves and stems in compost at all? Never. No. Not even if they look clean. Oh, all right. Yeah. Too late now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if it's any consolation, I do. So. Uh -huh. But well, then I, I don't I don't grow a lot of potatoes, so yeah. it's not such a big a big issue for me. So the last question, it's actually we've got one last question, which is from Sarah. Would you like to ask that question? Hi. Um yeah, so I was just wondering um if you had any tips for controlling thrips and whether they affect any fruit and veg crops or whether it is just sort of roses they cause a problem for because I seem to have had loads since everybody around me is harvesting their fields at the moment. Hmm. Uh, are you talking about the uh, sometimes call them uh, thunderbugs. thunderbugs? Thunderbugs, harvest mites. Yeah, yeah, the little yeah. tiny thunderbug things. Which, uh -huh. which the, the, only, the only inconvenience is that they land on the roses, they don't do any harm to them. Oh, they, they do. They, they get inside the buds and cause loads of damage to the formation of, of the buds on roses. But I didn't know if they do anything to vegetable crops or anything like that, because I've got them everywhere, all over my garden at the moment. Right. I've never no known them to cause damage to the buds of roses. Um... They're listed on like RHS as a rose disease, and they show you pictures of like what it does to roses and things like that. And... They're talked about quite frequently on like rose groups and things on Facebook as a, as a major, major problem. But that's why I didn't know, maybe they don't affect any other plants in that way. Maybe it is just roses. No. Wait, what part of the world are you from? Uh, I'm in North Yorkshire. Right. Well, we're quite fortunate here is that we very rarely get a bad year for these thunderflies. Yeah. Um, so I haven't actually seen it. I've never had to kind of research it and look it up. I don't know. Um, well, again, our old friend Soft Soap, every day just going out and giving yeah, them a... Yeah, I haven't work. tried that yet. I was, that is what I was thinking. I maybe need to try that because I did resort to using a um, bug clear, um, that, which is a mydocloprid, and 
I don't really want to use systemic insecticides and that didn't even seem to work to be honest so I thought yeah maybe the soap's the way to go yeah well it would certainly clog them up wouldn't it yeah yeah brilliant thank you okay Okay, I think that's the end of the questions that we've got written down. If anyone else would like to ask a question, you could put your hand up just now using the, um, oh, is there a reaction button, I think? Um, or if there's anything else any, that anyone would like to ask just now. No hands up. Nope. Excellent. Thank you very much, Peter. I think that says, just about on time as well. Okay. Thank you. Right. That's great. Yeah, bye. 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 <laughs> bye. And hopefully we're going to have another one uh, within a month or so uh, at, the, at the latest. So I hope to see you again later on. Yeah. Bye. Bye. It's nice seeing all the familiar faces that come bye. back as well. I love it. <laughs>